Welcome and hello. My name is Dawn Bittison. I'm a museum specialist at the Alaska Office of the Arctic Study Center, part of the Smithsonian Institution. I'd like to welcome you to our webinar, Cultural Appreciation versus Cultural Appropriation, a conversation with Alaska Native artists. Before we begin our conversation, I'd like to ask Melissa Shaganoff to give a land acknowledgement for us. Mm -hmm. Don. Melissa Shagnos is at the land, Yudishyuth Koyakara Atlan, Naitini Ana Kayak Sinsyarin, uh Nul Isda. Um uh, good morning. My name is Melissa Shaganoff. I am Caribou and Fish Eater Clan from Night Diniana or Chickaloon Village. And I currently sit in the Gayatnu in uh, Anchorage. I want to recognize that the Arctic Study Center, the Smithsonian Arctic Study Center, uh, resides in uh, Dagayu, that it is uh, the place um, currently stewarded and cared for by the Denina people. Uh, land acknowledgments are really important uh, in recognizing where we sit, you know, the land that we are are working from and benefiting from and in order to truly appreciate that we need to recognize the relationships the indigenous people have with that place and how they've stewarded it for thousands of years and with that i, I really want to recognize the denina people for stewarding on uh, you in uh, anchorage what is now known as anchorage uh Chinandan. thank you melissa I'd also like to thank our partners and funders who have helped make this event possible. The Smithsonian Institution's Recovering Voices Program, the Experimental Humanities Collaborative Network, sponsored by the Open Society University Network, and the generous supporters of the Arctic Study Center in Alaska. Next, I'd like to briefly introduce our speakers. You can learn more about them on the event website and find links to their work. Melissa Shaganoff, who will be our moderator as well as a speaker, is an artist, curator, and social activist. Melissa is an indigenous woman of Atna, Athabascan, and Paiute heritage. Her work explores identity and representation, utilizing customary indigenous and Western methods. Dini Maharis is a Chickalone village tribal citizen raised by his storyteller mother, Patricia Wade, and taught cultural values and traditions by Atna, Athabascan clan grandmother, Catherine Wade. Dini is an illustrator and graphic artist, and he collaborates on comic books for children and adults. He also teaches art workshops for schools and online education. Vera Starbard is a Clinket and Denina writer and editor. She's playwright in residence at the Perseverance, excuse me, at the Perseverance Theater through the Andrew W. Mellon National Playwright Residency Program and editor of First Alaskans Magazine. Vera is also a writer for the PBS kids program, Molly of Denali. Peter Williams is a Yupik culture bearer, artist, designer, filmmaker, and educator originally from Akiak, currently based in Sitka. His hand-sewn works repurpose skin from traditional foods that he harvests, bridging the worlds of indigenous art, fashion, and subsistence. Melissa, please take it from here. Really, Jan, I also really wanna recognize uh, Don Bittison for putting this group together. Um, Don Bittison is a really wonderful example of, uh, you know, actions of, of, of allyship and reparations um, for our communities. And I just really want to recognize and appreciate her as well. Um, I'm really excited about this discussion. Uh, I think everyone probably on this panel has talked about cultural appropriation or cultural appreciation at one point. Um, it's the labor many indigenous people are asked to explain over and over again. And I think that part of the reason why we agreed to do it so many times is because um, it's a love for our community. It's, uh, it's the work we want to do. So our elders, our culture bearers, and you know our cousins and brothers and sisters and aunties and uncles um, maybe don't have to do. You know, and so I think that's a big part of why we agree to have this conversation so many times because cultural appropriation is truly uh, is truly an, an extension of um, systemic racism within uh, 
our institutions and within this nation. So it's important for us to talk about. I first want to start off with a definition that this group uh, worked together to, to create um, of cultural appropriation. And then we're going to dive into some personal experiences from this group on cultural appropriation. And uh, yeah, so I'll go ahead and get started with reading that. Cultural appropriation is when a person, business, or institution takes any elements or expressions of a culture that is not their own for commercial, social, or personal use, and or without full understanding of or permission from that culture. Uh, you know, I, I'd, I'd really like to start with uh, some personal experiences because everything can be, I think, intellectualized and in, in, in how we discuss it. And, uh, but I think that the real meat of, of what we're talking about is um, what cultural appropriation represents for all of us personally, you know, as creative people, as makers, you know, as, as people that hold part of our culture in a very public arena. Um, so, you know, I would just like to, you know, ask if, if anyone would like to start with any examples um, Maybe we could start with uh, Peter, if you were if you were ready. Sure. Sorry. Can you um, say that again? Um, I I just like to hear if you had any sort of personal uh, examples of cultural appropriation that you'd be you'd be uh, interested in sharing with this group. Mm hmm. Goyana, uh, Goyana, everyone for being here. Um, I think. I'd like to like start by talking about how I think part of the problem is that Alaska Natives and Indigenous people globally are still not viewed as fully human. And because we're not viewed as fully human, then we're not treated as equals and we're not treated as people. And I think that that's really where a lot of this stems from. And it's embedded in uh, the Declaration of Independence. It's um, embedded in our constitution, and it also is embedded in the doctrine of discovery. So <clears throat> what we're talking about today stems, you know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. Um, so I think it's important to like keep that in mind. And I also really appreciate some of the materials that was provided, uh, the video in particular talking about cultural appropriation and appreciation and about participation. And I think it's important for people to realize that, that it's a form of participation. Um, if you're not a part of the culture, let's say my Yupik culture, um, you're also participating in a form. And so how do you wanna participate? Uh, do you want it to be exploitative or participatory? And so I went off <laughs> on a little bit bit of a different way than, than giving a specific uh, example. But real quick in closing, I was at the Heard Museum uh, art show attending it, uh, this Native American arts and crafts show uh, in Phoenix. I was there for an event with other Native artists and we just happened to go to check it out. And we were all having lunch together and sitting at a table and these group of older white folks uh, were about ready to sit down. Um, before they did, we all left. And one of the other fellows that was a part of this program went back in line to get more food. And so she left her items that she bought. So because she didn't know that we all left, I went back to the table to grab them, to give them to her so they wouldn't be lost or stolen. And as I did that, this older white woman looked at me and said, can you wipe off the table? Um, which really just took me by surprise. <laughs> and I'm like, no, no, I can't, like, I don't work here. Um, and her reaction was, oh, you know, sorry. So I kind of like share that in this realm of what is appreciation and how do we appreciate? And so I think there's many folks that will come to native events and native cultural events and to try to like support us and appreciate us but i still think that they're looking at us in more of this less than human way um <clears throat> Goyana. you know janan um 
I think that uh, oftentimes we we have these discussions and I think cultural appropriation, you know, versus cultural appreciation in some opinions might feel like a really soft topic, you know, but at the same time, um, you know, it's this trickle down of of that experience that you're talking about, you know, and it's one that's not uh, that's that's not unique, you know. It's something that many indigenous people experience, you know, even within sort of realms of 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 perceived power, right? Of like selling our artwork, making our life through art, you know. There's still this like perception of um, of this sort of hierarchical experience, you know, and I think that. A lot of times our art and, you know, our culture and our music and the things that we share, our stories that we share, you know, uh, there's this idea because we're sharing it that it's for your consumption and that you're able to consume it and you're able to be inspired by it and replicate it because somehow you're supporting us, you know, but part of that support is also uh, recognizing us for our for the work that's there. You know, I think many, many forms of of indigenous uh, art, you know, Clinket form line, Yupik Cuspucks, you know, all these things, they're kind of like put into um, these categories and the individual is removed. You know, the artist is removed, which is so unindigenous. You know, it's not a way that we act. We always recognize our makers and our storytellers and our culture bearers in our communities. You know, and I think that that this sort of removal of the person, you know, from these art forms is like a part of colonialism and part of really settler colonialism. Now I went off on a tangent, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I, I, you know, I'd really like to invite, you know, Vera and Demi to share anything that that they would like to to, you know, to to add to to this idea of, um, you know, well, not this idea, the personal experiences you've had with cultural appropriation. Yeah, goodness, I also want to add very starboard, you had to a sock to quay, you had to a sock, yay hi hut. And I'm coming to you from Denina land also. Um, I think it, in some ways I get kind of the easy one because I work in theater and television <laughs> um, and that's probably how most of us are kind of even introduced to cultural appropriation, whether we know it or not, because we see um, cartoons taking on images of native people. Um, and a lot of times those are stereotypes, less cultural appropriation or appreciation. They're not really depicting anything, but um, sometimes they are sort of trying to say they're being authentic without being authentic. Um, we could name a dozen movies off the top of my head that sort of um, take from native culture in a way that is not respectful, that is not um, asking people all the way down to, you know, Klingon culture has um, Betty White, I love you, but you know, she, she did this horrible scene um, in one of them, in one of the, a pretty big movie with Sandra Bullock and Ryan Reynolds. And um, it's, it's things like that, that are just sort of jarring to see because for starters, they're literally sort of taking this culture that you love and cherish and grew up in and know and making it seem silly. It, it often just seems so silly the way they portray it. And so that's jarring. And then you realize, is this how they see us? Do they see us as silly? And you start to question just a, a core identity question. Um, but then, and this is maybe revealing more of my process, but, and then you get a little angry because they're taking away my agency and being able to tell our story. Um, and that's, I think, also probably a way you start looking at it as like a younger person a somewhat older person and a somewhat older person is um there's many tears <laughs> to sort of the harm of it and also sort of the realization of it so um i think cultural appropriation as a native artist is exhausting you see it 
every day, literally, um, whether it's my art or my art form or just beaded earrings that someone's trying to pass off, you know, as native um, all the way to something that literally hundreds of people have spent a lot of time and energy and millions of dollars to represent us versus just having us do the thing. So um, yeah, I think my sort of field is probably one that most of us have uh, seen the most visible. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I think that um, something you said that really resonates with me is, is the agency being taken away, right? The, the ability to tell our own stories. Because I think that when parts of our culture is, is cherry picked and represented, you know, without the full understanding, that's an important part of our of our definition without full understanding, you know, that um, our culture is inevitably misrepresented, you know, so when we are in those arenas to tell our own stories, you know, with the work that you do, Vera, you know, um, that you have the whole rest of you know society looking back at you and saying well no that can't be true because i saw it this way you know in a way that's so steeped in stereotypes that are meant to sort of remove our agency and remove our power right if we can't even tell who we are if we can't even you know um express our identity to you without you believing us um that's a huge problem you know, and that takes away completely all of our power and our agency, you know, as people, um, you know, and there's there's so many questions as to like why, you know, more Native people don't work in museums, why more Native people don't work in the institutions, why more Native people aren't present, you know, in in uh, pop culture. And it's because so much of, of, of what's represented um, of us is false you know, and that it, and that it is, it perpetuates that cycle of not even being able to fit within, uh, within, within the stereotype, because that's not who we are, you know, and it's not, uh, that's not what it means to be um, our culture, you know, and to, to be who we are as, as uh, authentic Indigenous people, you know, I, I also think too, that there's this aspect of, um, you know, of, of, of grouping, people together grouping things together and uh, and and that's a way to also remove the person you know and the personal experience from something uh you're able to sort of like look on you know it's that cultural glacier look on the very tip of the glacier and 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 find all the things that you you want to see you know in in our arts and our culture and our music um, you know, in our stories, but everything beneath that, the sort of deep knowledge, the relationships we have to land, to the waters, to the animals, you know, um, our way of looking at the world, all of that stuff is lost. And all of that stuff is really the meat of who we are, you know, and I think that uh, when you decide just to pick the parts that um, are interesting to you, uh, you're really missing out. Um, and I and I speak that to that collectively to like the larger culture, uh, you know. I I'd like to give Demi a, a an opportunity to to speak to this too in the personal experiences, you know, as as a new media artist and someone who's trying to represent, you know, Atna characters, Atna people, you know, to Alaska and to the larger sort of like new media comic, um, you know, uh, experience why is it so important to you to represent that authentic identity? Thanks for having me. Um, I was born and raised uh, in Alaska in Anchorage. I'm in Seattle currently, but I attended uh, Yanni Da'a tribal school for the first two years it was open. I, you know, was raised around uh, my grandma growing up. And I think I'd say that, you know, um, part of my experience has been some of the first collab creative collaborations that I've had as an artist, as a comic book artist, were with my grandma, uh, illustrating some of the stories that she would that she would tell us growing up, some of the traditional stories, and she gave me a real uh, creative freedom, like a very wide berth to to illustrate and to draw what I wanted, and she was always supportive of my art, and so was my mom, and that really opened up, you know, a lot of opportunities through the years for me to be able to work with, you know, different cultures and illustrate 
comic book stories and just, you know, illustration work uh, for, for other people, including, um, including my own tribe uh, as I've grown up. Uh, and I think that now where I'm at uh, with the project that I'm currently working on, I'm working on a comic book with Melissa at the moment. I'm really actively trying to understand and represent our culture in a way that I think is much more carefully, you know, represented. Uh, so in a way, I feel like I'm in the process right now of learning how to uh, not appropriate, but appreciate even my own uh, culture. And, and, it's a, and it's a learning process that I feel like you know, I'm, I'm going through right now. Um, it's important to me. I feel like representation is, is important. And I feel that there's so much, you know, representation, that there, there's so much opportunity for representation, you know, ever, anywhere. But, you know, for let's just say Alaska, I, I mean, I want to uh, just to show our little, you know, corner of Alaska and represent it in, in a way that, you know, is unique. And uh, I feel like I'm, you know, really lucky to be working with Melissa on this and we're kind of figuring it out as we go, I think. Yeah, thank you, Demi. I feel really lucky to work with you as well. And um, I think that you kind of touch upon something that I, you know, that I really want to address, um, you know, because I know everyone on this, this call, you know, the speakers, you know, do a lot of work to, to represent, you know, uh, our cultures and our beliefs in in the most accurate, transparent and good way, right? Because part of that representation is also a protection, you know, of our communities, you know, and, and who it is that we are. And it's a huge responsibility. And it takes a lot of effort and a lot of work. You know, I think that there's kind of this belief that if you're a, a native person, you're sort of born like with with the instructions and that, you know, you have all elements of culture, you know exactly the right thing it is to do. Um, and that's, at least for me, that's not true. You have to do the work of, of research and of talking to your elders and of talking to culture bearers in your community to making sure that you're representing not only your own experience, but their experience, you know, uh, as well. And, you know, I'm sure there's something Vera can, can um, you know, talk about too, is, is sort of that responsibility that's on your shoulders when you're telling stories. And I think you would tell stories, you know, through all so many ways, the way Peter tells stories, you know, through his garments and, and through, you know, the writing I've seen of his and, and Demi's comic, it's, it's a huge responsibility. So having people culturally appropriate those stories that we work so hard to tell, um, and then misrepresent them. It, it makes it so difficult for for any authenticity and any way for our communities to um, be able to have any power in these arenas. You know, it's like cultural appropriation is truly another um, form of 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 colonialism and domination and uh, asserting a power over us you know, by, by taking even the thing that, um, that we're, that we're trying to, to learn about and work through and then subverting it, uh, because those things are deeply effective are, are affecting on our young people and, uh, it's not okay. <laughs> yes. It, would anyone else like to, um, kind of finish out as we, as we kind of in these personal experiences and talk about maybe ways that people can collaborate and appreciate in a respectful way, um, you know, I want to give space. Vera? Yeah, I do have one that it's it's also noticeable when it's not. And I don't know that some um, people that are trying to sort of culturally appropriate realize that it's noticeable. Um, I actually just had a conversation with um, a TV production company where they sent me the sample and it was like, oh. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to guess you do not have any Native people working on this. They're like, yeah. And it was pointing out some really obvious things, um, like a Clinkett person being in Yupik country. Like, we, there are Clinkett people in Yupik country, but that is not where Clinkett people <laughs> come from. And just sort of some of the obvious things. 
but I had um, one of my first sort of play experiences very early in my playwright career was going to a play, being invited, and it was sold to me as a Klingit play. And I went, oh, okay, so we're going, and it was, it was, it was a good play, actually. It was a very good play, but I was struck, I, I noticed, I had just finished a lot of the same research that this play presented for um, a story that I was working on. It was like, huh. He only decided to go surface level. He only decided to go with the research. And at the very end, it sort of twisted into this more like Eastern philosophy thing. And as we were leaving, I was like, oh, it's such a missed opportunity to, to really present Klinkett philosophy well, you know, at the end and why he kind of turned into this other thing. And I was with a non-Native friend who was going back. He's like, no, no, it was great. Did you understand? I was like, no, I understood it. I'm just saying like, we're in a Klinkett play. He should have like gone with that. And it was then she's like, you realize that wasn't written by a Klinkett person, that was a white person. And it just like, oh, well, that makes a lot more sense. <laughs> like the whole play makes a lot more sense. And me believing it was sort of Klinkett written, um, it was so weird, like for me to go like, why would this Klinkett, like, what are the choices? There's a strange choices. Um, it's a person who had spent his whole life studying Klinkett things and still couldn't authentically represent it. And it was noticeable to someone who actually believed it was written by a Klinkett person. So I think it's also important to know that it's not even just if you get it grossly wrong, nothing that he said was wrong, um, but you still aren't going to get the same thing that a Klinkett person could do or a native person can do. And that goes from visual art to stories being told to uh, music. I mean, you, we know it, other people know it. And you do sort of end up watering it down if you keep presenting these things as authentic that aren't. It's so true, you know, that it is a complete missed, opp missed opportunity, you know, when um, these stories are kind of told or this work is done, you know, without kind of like that authentic representation. You know, it's like, uh, I think that, um, it's something that, you know, institutions, you know, uh, museums, universities, you know, they, they kind of will give themselves permission to sort of, um, you know, with their degree, you know, with their, uh, you know, whatever um, position to to kind of like tell tell our stories, you know, and to represent us and to, you know, make interpretations of things. Um, and and the fact is, uh, it, it's never going to be able to represent a lived life, you know, in that culture, or represent that experience. And I don't think that it's, I don't think that it's that it that it should be viewed as is such is like a, uh, you know, a detriment to them or, or something that they are not able to do. It's an opportunity for them to build relationships, you know, to tell those authentic stories. And it makes me think a lot about, you know, the work that, that Demi's doing, you know, and that the the collective that we're part of, Shared Universe does. Um, Demi, do you want to talk a little bit about like creating those relationships and, and some of what you've seen with the collective you work with and or that we work with? I feel that, you know, at, at the core of this, it is about relationships and it's about people. And I think, you know, understanding, like really understanding um, someone's lived experience, uh, it, it, it gives you the, you know, the framework that you can actually understand. Like, you know, telling a story inherently in my mind, I mean, I've just been programmed almost, you know, through culture and, uh, movies and you know comic books and whatever it's just a very you know particular linear way of looking at stories and I think that I mean I'm, I'm kind of trying to break myself out of that for this project I want to learn you know the difference between how a story is told uh you know traditionally than than how you know like a western you know narrative is told um and it's not I don't think it's one thing that you can just pick up on I think you need to put yourself in the shoes of you know I guess yeah your elders you know your ancestors and uh it's I don't know it's uh yeah I, I guess that's you know it's a learning opportunity 
Yeah, you know, and I think that what a lot of what you're saying to me resonates as like perspective taking, you know, and that sort of any kind of like good collaboration needs to start with that, needs to start with the perspective taking. Um, Peter, I saw, I saw that you unmiked. Is, is there anything you'd like to share? Oh, sorry. Um, didn't mean to jump in. I just actually unmiked in case you were going to come to me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, I, I was, but <laughs> I mean, I, yeah, is there, is there anything you would like to share on just what we're talking about or, or even kind mm -hmm. of like steps forward in, in appreciation mm -hmm. or appropriate collaboration? Yeah, there's so much just beautiful things being said um, and really just appreciative of, of being able to share this space with you and just, and just talk and hear what you have to say. Um, there's so many just really great points that are being brought up. So I think specifically with collaboration, using an example, uh, I've often had a lot of white partners in my um, kind of like, especially like film uh, and things like that. And I'm working on a project right now. It's been a while, we're finishing it up. It's a short documentary. And one of the things that he said to me uh, was really realizing he didn't understand coming into it, how much work he had to do you know, how much, how much um, work he really needed to do to be kind of respectful and to come at it from a good way. And I still feel like he's got so much more work he needs to do because, um, you know, we're taught kind of as Demi was saying, you know, we're, we're kind of like taught the opposite and Vera saying it too, like, like this is what we're presented with. And so there's so much unlearning that has to occur. And then there's all so much learning that needs to happen. And it's really years. Um, and so I think that with like collaboration too, to keep in mind that the work is ongoing, you know, we're, we're talking about, you know, uh, colonial brutality, brutality for, you know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, uh, and how ingrained that is. And um, when we're starting to have these conversations, they're going to be changing. I think that's one of the problems with, uh, like settlements and treaties besides them being broken and besides like the the federal government coming at these things with just continuing the same oppression um, I think one of the things that's left out is that the work's ongoing we're understanding through each generation uh, we're understanding we're coming together in different ways and so I, I think being able to hold that space as we collaborate and realize that we have a long ways to go um, but we can't we can't just like figure it out in an hour, right? It's, it's, a, it's a constant practice that has to keep going and it's not always gonna be perfect. And, and, and that's okay, you know? And, and I think that's something too, of, of I heard this, the saying about um, kind of perfectionism being like a, like a, I forget how it was phrased, but something kind of like it was fundamental to white supremacy. Um, that, that things like have to be perfect, uh, which, which isn't the case. And I think in creating these spaces and collaboration, one of the things that I've, that I've kind of found as well is I think the need to be able to talk about these things and realize that we're not trying to crucify anyone. We're not trying to vilify anyone. We're just simply explaining the reality in the world in which we exist, which is an unjust one. And it's one that needs to be vocalized as such, um, but there's no, that's not an attack. That's actually just like talking about it as we're talking about, like I talk about the weather, as I talk about like the sky and this is, you know, this water is wet. <laughs> um, this, this is just like the reality. And it's actually an opportunity for us to come together closer. Like I, I bring these things up and these conversations up, not as a form for division, but it's actually as a form of coming together. Um, but it does require acknowledgement of some really hard truths that are, that are quite uncomfortable for a lot of people, especially people who have privilege and have power um, because of the color of their skin. And so I think that that's challenging, <clears throat> challenging to come into those conversations, but I'd also like say to to recognize that um, it's actually coming to a place of, you know, unity and trying to um, have a form of kind of stand equal footing, which I'll, I'll end with that, with the, what kind of you brought up about earlier about agency, 
you know, the issue of agency or the lack of agency in cultural appropriation. Um, and, and what Bira is also talking about was space and, and inclusion and, and like how it would be so much better. It's missed opportunity to not have our voices included in these conversations that are about us. And that is incredibly systemic. Wow, um, you made so many just like amazing points, you know, and just that that point that <laughs> that minute, <laughs> you know, and I think that I, uh, you know, something that really kind of, you know, resonates with me is, um, I think when we describe these things and kind of the the labor in the labor that we're doing and the work that we're doing to, you know, explain and and make this make kind of our feelings about these things known. Um, I think what it triggers in a lot of people is a defensiveness. It's this sort of like feeling of like, well, I did wrong and I can't really accept it. And so my defense mechanism is to kind of gaslight you and tell you that cultural appropriation is not really an important sort of topic, you know, and when you brought up the perfectionism, you know, I, I immediately thought of kind of like, you know, it, it is kind of um, a, uh, an ideal that, that if we're in the process of change, if we're in the process of trying to like always do better, it's never attainable you know, and it's kind of this, um, this belief that, well, we just have to sort of kind of keep every one quiet that criticizes these things. And in some ways, the way you do that is to oppress them and to remove their identity and their culture. You know, it's, uh, you know, I, I had a personal experience, you know, working for, you know, a museum where um, when I brought up, uh, you know, artwork that was culturally appropriative and considering whether or not we should support this artwork, it was immediately met, met with a defensiveness and kind of this gaslighting of even something that I knew was so culturally appropriative, telling me that it wasn't, telling me that that artist, well, that artist is a good person. It's like, what, you don't really know them. And, and you know, if you knew them, you, you wouldn't, you wouldn't um, think these things, you know, but, but appropriation, you know, is appropriation you know that there isn't kind of like this um this 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 like scale you know if somebody tells you something is appropriative it's it's up to you to to believe them and to check when you have those kind of um defensive experiences you know and uh i think too that that part of that defensiveness is a is a worry that you've done something wrong but like you said, Peter, is that everyone kind of starts somewhere and that that really what we're talking about is kind of equity in in our institutions, in our universities, in our jobs, you know, that if we want to create like an equitable, you know, experience for people, then then we need to be listening to them, you know, and we need to be hearing uh, their experiences and and look at it as an opportunity to make change you know, to dis to figure out kind of like, what are the ways can I equitably collaborate with this person, you know, and you're right, a lot of that does take a lot of work, and a lot of sort of self education, you know, and, um, but that's kind of the result of colonialism, is that when you remove people's identity, you know, from spaces, and uh, you make it so difficult for them to tell their own stories, um, part of that is is that you need to be in a listening space and part of that is that you need to be doing uh a lot of that work so the burden isn't always on us to make you believe us i think that that a lot of times when we call out a, cult a cultural appropriation uh it's this experience of well now i need to convince people you know and and uh that's a really difficult sort of position to put people in you know, um, if you don't believe me in, in who I say I am, uh, I think the problem might lie with you, <laughs> you know, and with your, you know, trust. <laughs> um, yeah. Anyways, uh, 
uh, I, you know, I, I'd like to kind of like dive a little bit more into sort of uh, what are kind of like those things that we can do, you know, um, we collectively to work with each other to appropriate collaborate to appropriately collaborate and just a few things that we all discuss together, you know, that um, it requires consent, you know, it requires, you know, a compensation. Um, and also like a representation of, of authorship and the work, you know, that people have done with you. Yeah, is there is there anything else that when you collaborate with people, that would be like best practices that we could share? Whenever people ask, because and that's asked a lot in theater circles or TV circles as far as like, but how do I? And um we actually with Molly or Denali had a great one of the most popular and the most the, the episode that sort of we all tell people to watch is Grandpa's Drum, which is a short version about um, one of the elders was made to go to boarding school and um, was told he couldn't sing his songs anymore. And sort of Molly helps her grandpa realize that it's okay now. And and it's it's a very terrible um, synopsis of what the episode is, but go watch it. I challenge you not to feel emotional on it. Um, and that was written by a white person that was not written by um, a native writer. I was in the room though, and I'm still very proud of that episode. I don't feel it sort of culturally appropriated because it was done correctly. There were, um, I, was, I was a native writer. There was a native uh, creative producer. There were four cultural advisory members who their entire job was to uh, sort of tell people that they're off track or on track or whatever. But even before that, before that writer got to the point of that story, they had gone through two days of going to villages. That story was actually inspired by an elder who gave that story. It wasn't a story that was taken. It was a story that was given specifically to help these non-native writers with the show. Um, they went through university, you know, like um, little classes that talked about um, sort of the traumas of boarding school. So it wasn't done without, and all of those people were paid. <laughs> all of those native people were paid. Um, and then literally every single um, version of the script went through native advisors. Um, there were final says on it, <laughs> like can, can't do this. There was a discussion in the room just about how that can be presented respectfully to elders um, so that it's not triggering something that we can't then sort of wrap up. Um, and that to me was such a great, this is how you do it. This is how it can be done. Um, and it was such a great wake up call for me to realize what the show is about. Mm -hmm. I went in honestly assuming it was like any other non-native thing I'd ever been involved in, which is, all right, it's going to be kind of stereotypical. They're going to trample over it and I'm going to go in and fight for it. And this is how it's going to go. So it was wonderful to see. I was just there to write. <laughs> they just wanted me to write. They had everything else taken care of in a really, really considered way. Um, to me, it was just proof it can be done. <laughs> it can be done really well. Um, is it perfect? No, of course there's problems with the show that we still you know, go over and we're continually trying to improve on, but um, it can be done. And I take that forward into sort of what I do now in communities that I'm not a part of. Um, I have an idea I'd really like to do for, um, with a transgender character in a play. I'm not transgender. I will not do that without either a co-writer, co-creator, a consultant who's heavily um, involved and compensated and credited, um, something like that. And I haven't found that person yet. And I won't do the story <laughs> until I have that person or persons um, that will come along and do it with me. I mean, there's, it's, to me, it's, in some ways, it's easy. if you can't do it right, just don't do it. Like literally, don't do it. You know? <laughs> but try, please try to do it right first. That's so amazing, Vera, because you, you hit it right on the head in that you, you're you having this experience, um, you know, of, of wanting to write this character, but you recognize that it's not of, 
your experience. And so you're not going to do it until you're able to represent it in that way. And I, I kind of love the this sort of model that you're talking about, because you're really kind of getting at the core that, you know, if you want stories to be told, you know, we're, you know, we're, we're speaking on the platform of the Smithsonian, you know, an institution. If we want Indigenous stories to be told at an institution, then then people like us need to be involved at the very beginning and at the every sort of checkpoint, you know, in making decisions, you know, that we need to be trusted, you know, to make those decisions, to say yes or no to things, you know, and to, and to, and to be listened to, you know, um, I think so much of uh, sometimes ego and fear gets in the way of, of those things, you know, um, but really, if, if our goal is to tell the most authentic, true, best story, it doesn't live in a book. It lives within us and within our lived experiences. You need to work with us for those to be told and to be done right, I think. Um, yeah, that's such a that's such a beautiful, beautiful way. Um, so collaboration, appropriate collaboration means at the beginning. That means at the impetus at the creation of all of these projects, you know, and um, not to talk about Dawn again, but, you know, I, I would say that even things that I'm not an expert in filmmaking or, or, you know, moose hide tanning, I did this project with Dawn and every step of the way, Dawn was able to use her skills, you know, as, as a, as a, as a, as a facilitator, you know, to, to fill in all the places where I didn't have skills you know, and to just provide kind of that kind of work, you know, we built a relationship over that. And she built a relationship with my elders for those things to happen. It really has to start with that, at least that that respect, you know, that mutual respect. And um, I think when you start there, it's pretty, it's pretty difficult to do the wrong thing. <laughs> if you have respect for someone and, uh, and their experiences. Um, Maybe that's optimistic, but well, anyway. let's say on that note, I think one of one of my favorite um, experiences understanding after it actually happened was that same writers meeting. It was the same. It was the very first writers meeting and they took um, all, all the writers were coming from New York and L.A. and Canada and you know, all these places. And I was the only um, just native writer they had. Um, they've since expanded. That was always the plan. Now it's majority Native writers. But um, all these other Native writers gathered for two days before. I didn't have, I, didn't, I wasn't able to go on those two days. So I thought I already knew everything, I guess. But <laughs> like, they had all the other writers had gone on these two days. And then we met and day one of that um, writer's room, we presented our ideas. And I was expecting these stereotypes. And I probably at the end of the day had the most stereotypical <laughs> Um, ideas because I thought that's what they wanted and thank goodness I went last so I was able to adjust but um, I learned only later because they had these very real very authentic um, story ideas all these people who'd mostly never been to Alaska before and I learned later um, I think it was actually two days later at a dinner um, that they all had gone through these two days of being introduced more to Alaska Native culture, Alaska Native people, going out to the villages, meeting um, with professors. Um, and they all went and literally threw out all of their ideas. They had come in with the stereotype. They had come in with exactly what we all see about Alaska um, represented. Um, but having just two days <laughs> of an introduction, and it was sounded like a pretty intense two days, but having just two days worth of experience um, literally just wiped what they had in mind out of their brains and they came in with completely new ideas. And to me, that's such a, wow, just two days, look what you can do with just two days of trying. <laughs> you know? And you come in with some of the best stories of the first season um, that were really based in Alaska Native culture because that's what they were introduced to. I love that. I love that. I mean, if this is a process of change, you know, I, I say this over and over again, it means that it's ongoing and it means that you start where you're at and you're and you're willing to to make those um, those moments where you need to throw out all your ideas, you know, and, and do be in that listening space, you know, and that, you know, Vera, you know, so graciously, graciously, like, 
explain that it's it's us too you know um but to a certain extent we we still need to be believed you know when we do kind of make those decisions you know in in collaboration you know i know that we probably have a lot of museum professionals you know um on on the call and you know i just want to you know thank everyone too for for sharing what they've had so this is from uh, a colleague in scotland uh Hello, I'm a lecturer in animation looking for ways of engaging our students with cultural appropriation versus appreciation in animation. Many of our students will eventually go on to work in character design or, or story departments of animation studios, and I want them to be able to critically evaluate their work and understand the importance of equitable cultural representation, especially if they end up working on the next Disney blockbuster with indigenous characters. So the question is, how would you like to see animations made in the future which deal with indigenous narratives and characters? Are there any key lessons you think the next generation of animators should engage with? As, as we're moving into these spaces, the more and more indigenous animators are being brought up, you know, but we still have animators of all different cultural backgrounds. You know, for people who are specifically developing, um, you know, a visual representation and a story representation, you know, of us. Um, what what sort of things uh, do you think that they should they should always start with in 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 creating that work? Some of it, I would say, is is to start kind of where I just um, where I just was talking about where you can do the research, you can do that. Um, initial, whether it's two days or whatever, um, I just, for one of the episodes that I'm writing for Molly right now, involves a uh, spoiler alert, Filipino culture. <laughs> um, and there is a consultant that I'm working with. And, but at the same time for this draft, and we have many drafts, I wasn't able to talk to him. So I like submitted it. And when I researched the heck out of this, but I apologize, I know that there's gonna be stuff wrong. Unless you actually hear from that person or from that culture, there's gonna be stuff wrong. And so it was like, please don't hate me. I'm not <laughs> like, um, I know better. I know not to do this, but because of this time and we have several drafts to work on, but um, was just that knowledge that you can do the research and you also need to talk to the people. So um, a lot of times you won't know that culture until you're working on that project. So it's not like, okay, go and learn everything you know about Indigenous people ever. <laughs> um, it doesn't work. Um, but you can know if you know you're coming into, um, I, I was asked to look at um, something that was Apache based. And I looked at it and I went, um, actually, I think you have the wrong culture here, in the, the wrong area. So I can learn of Apache, but I'm just going to put it out there that maybe we should be looking at more of a Navajo kind of stream here. Um, so some of it, the research does help even on authenticity, but I would also say for um, something like, especially future, future animators um, that are coming along and may never know <laughs> like what, what you're gonna work on until you're working on it. It is just sort of, it's, it's kind of like repetitious, but it's getting to know whatever it is that you're working on, whatever culture it is, getting to know that as intimately as possible and digging in, doing the work. Um, we have some really funny times, actually, when I first went to Boston, where um, at the time it's WGBH, it's GBH now, the production company for Molly. And we went in and I was given this amazing tour and we go in and they're like, do you want to see some early episodes? And it was very early. Um, and it was less episodes and more just pieces. And I was like, of course I do. Um, and they showed this um, different animations and some just clips. And one was a library in the village. And I was like, oh, big library, cool. And they all laughed and I was like, what's going on? And this is like the director of the animators and, and everything and they all laughed. And I was like, what? And they're like, uh, that's the very small version that we to go down to because these animators, none of the animators live in Alaska. Um, none of them are native. So, and a lot of them, like the director stuff, are based in East Coast United States. They had in a village, in an Alaska village, this massive like class P 
paneled. Um, it, it sounds like it was sort of Lusac Library, like someone like looked up the Anchorage Lusac Library and had like this big version in this, you know, village of a couple hundred people. <laughs> And so they laughed when I was like, oh, it's a big, uh, what they came up with was a big to me. And it really is, if you look at the library in Molly Dunley, it's actually a really big library for a couple hundred people. Um, but the animators didn't know either. And I think that was an interesting thing for them to realize like, oh gosh, like this is, this is starting in a different place, even from the animators. And I have to so much like, this episode that I did, uh, just finished, sent in a whole bunch of photos of what I meant in one video of what I meant. There was a lot of back and forth on something that was pretty baseline for me. It was like, I don't know how to explain it. It's this, this what it is, but trying to get them to understand and give references for these things. So there's an awful lot of work on the part of the culture being represented to do that, if that could be lessened at all. And I know this is a very long answer. I'm like, I'm literally thinking like, what if the, the people you're teaching are, are gonna work on the show? What can I tell them? <laughs> I tell them to come in with, but I'm, I'm that's it. It's do the work and it's, and that's not bad on the animators. They aren't really used to that. That's not part of the industry really to sort of do that kind of work. Um, something I love about Molly is they expect a lot more work um, for what they're doing than what a lot of shows. Now that I've worked on a couple other animated shows, I see how true that is. Um, there's no expectation. I literally got told in one, like, there's no educational component, do whatever you want. It was like, oh, break my heart. <laughs> but it's do the work, uh, come into it with what you can. And it's easier for me to correct what you already have than to sort of go, oh no. <laughs> um, and I've seen some stuff after the show is aired that isn't quite correct that I didn't have the opportunity to. So yeah, big long answer. I was like, let's let's talk. <laughs> I have ideas. Yeah. Well, you're talking about doing oh, the work. And I think that a big part of it is uh is when you're approaching any project and i think this is animation this is like museum interpretation this is you know this is shows this is you know writing a paper if you are working with a culture that is not your own you need to work in research time to make appropriate relationships to to the best of your abilities find like an accurate representation of those things you know and 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 an, and and someone that you can you can work with equitably meaning working that into your budget you know as far as like how it is that you pay someone for their expertise you know um i think that that it's building into like your work plan uh relationships and research you know relationships research and budget <laughs> You know into those things that um that part of that is like uh very important i kind of want to like push this question to demi um just because in in the current work demi's doing uh he'll be representing uh more than just our atna culture you know and in kind of like the plans at least sort of the loose plans at the moment you know to represent other cultures in alaska um would you mind sharing some of those plans, Demi? I just kind of wanted to reinforce what was what was being said about the collaboration versus appropriation. I, I feel that at its core, cultural appropriation is lazy. And whether on the surface, if you might not understand it or not, as artists, and even as just art appreciators, you understand when work is lazy or when work has had a lot of effort put into it. And I feel like part of that effort in the collaboration is so important that will come out and will show in the work. Uh, it's undeniable when it's done correctly. I mean, I've heard multiple people talk about the, you know, grand, grandfather's drum episode for that reason in particular, I say, because it's a prime example of collaboration. Um, as far as the animators and the, the animation work, I mean, I think that that's the same thing. It's just, you have to like, you know, work that into the design phase is lit is literally trying to reach out and, you know, create and establish a relationship uh, with somebody who you can communicate with uh, about that. I think that the authenticity is, you know, is super important because it's going to 
it's going to create actual value in your work. So yeah, the idea about, uh, you know, without giving too much away, I do want to, you know, represent different uh, cultures in and around Alaska. And I'm starting kind of with my own culture because I want to establish um, an idea in my mind, almost a framework of how to incorporate culture bearers and, you know, how to work in the, the correct representation uh, in order to do it. And it's not going to be a one size fits all for every culture. I don't, I don't envision that. I feel like every, any working relationship with uh, two people is going to be, is going to be different somehow. Um, but yeah, I, I just feel that, you know, the care and the effort put into representation, authentic representation, uh, it's undeniable. In, in the outcome, you know, the art, the quality, the, you know, the finished product, it's, it, it has an authentic authenticity to it that is undeniable. And, you know, that's what I hope to strive for. It's like, you know, like, like, like uh, Peter was saying, it's, it's work, it's not like going to be perfect. It's, you know, it's a work in progress. And I feel that establishing those relationships is about, you know, reversing colonization in, in, in more, um, you know, a more uh, relationship building. Um, so I'm just, you know, excited to be able to work on projects like that and, and be part of, you know, be part of that, that learning curve. Because I think, I think it's moving in that direction. I see more and more the, the emphasis and the, the focus and the care taken to, you know, authentically represent different cultures in, in different media forms. And we're working in new mediums right now. So I feel like as artists, it's almost our responsibility in you know, new mediums to kind of like forge these new ways of going about doing art. And um, yeah, I, that's kind of my thoughts on it. I, th I think that's amazing because you're talking, you're really, you're you're talking about this uh, this sort of new way, new medium of for foraging like authentic stories. For me, like I, I think it's like a really old way of being actually, because what you're doing is that you're sharing kind of the credit, which you know in in Western culture that's really valued in the individualism. You know, where is in in our culture, Demi? we're always sharing who taught us, you know, we're always sharing who brought us to that knowledge and that information. And that's like a really indigenous way of being, which is, you know, sharing credit, publicly recognizing them, you know, and, and working with them and like in a way that, that everybody that's above board, like everybody can kind of see it, you know, and thinking about that from a storytelling perspective, it's like, you're the author, but you have all these co-authors, you know, in doing these things. And, um, and I think that that's like a really uh, valuable way um, to sort of frame, you could frame any work, you know, which is w whether you're a museum curator or you're an anthropologist or, you know, you're a, a, a writer or an artist that, you know, looking at um, things that you're representing and, uh, if it's not something that belongs to you, that you are working to collaborate and get consent. There was a question uh, uh, in, from the webinar that I wanted to address, because uh, I think it kind of like falls right in there. And, you know, you know, maybe this is even something that, uh, you know, Peter, you, you could you could talk to because there's so their question is, how does someone know if a person was given permission to use the native story or art? Um, if it was appropriated. Uh, I guess, Peter, like if you're looking at something, what are some of those kind of like signs? I initially want to start out with like, my initial thought is a very cynical one um, of that, like probably for the most part, it's not, you know, um, native done because we're not welcomed into the space to be um, able to, to represent ourselves. Um, and I think like one thing that maybe like coming from kind of the fashion design thing, like one thing, and it, and it goes beyond that as well, is often you hear like native inspired. Yeah. So if you hear native inspired, uh, that is your red flag 
um, that it is appropriation. Um, and it's one of those things that's just so heartbreaking to, to hear. Uh, as, as a fan of basketball, um, I was watching a basketball game a few years ago and one of the teams, the, the announcers were so excited to talk about how those jerseys were native inspired designs and just like my heart just broke of just like, how hard is it to find <laughs> <laughs> an indigenous person from your area where the basketball team is um, and, and to work with them um, to create that. So I, I hope that answered your question. I think it's, it's kind of tough too of like what we're specifically talking about. And I think it also like brings up um, some questions too of like certification processes and you know, like what are those certification processes and are they are they healthy and are they appropriate? So I think for the most part, it's it's really about finding out um, who does it the way they're talking about it. It, it. You know, if they're saying inspired. Um, also, what I often see is like the parentheses, right? Peter Williams parentheses UPIC. Um, so that's something that often I look for. Um, something that I often research when I come across stuff and like where there's like descendants of that kind of, you know, makes me just kind of wonder but like why they didn't put their specific tribal affiliation next to their name. Mm -hmm. um, so that's something to look for as well. I hope, I hope that answered your question. Yeah, no, I think those are really great points, right? Um, I think too that an, another aspect of that is uh, if you're working with indigenous people, um, it's part of your responsibility to make that authorship and to make that collaboration very known. You know, indigenous people should be represented in all these things. And when they are not, you know, when they're not credited in that, I think that uh, that that's a red flag for all of us to that when we see that, you know, that um, working the work that that's being done should be it, it should be very public and it should be very um, available. So when I don't see that, when I don't see the kind of uh, credit being given towards an indigenous person on working these things, it's, I, I always wonder, and um, I'm usually, uh, you know, pretty disappointed to find out that, that it wasn't, you know, uh, collaborated with in an equitable way. You know, I think that uh, it's important for us as consumers of this information, you know, as as even like, you know, consumers of art, you know, purchasing things that uh, that were that were responsible in those things. And that if we're going to participate in these systems and support these things, that uh, we also kind of hold them, have to hold them accountable, you know, for um, appropriative actions, and for things that are um, removing indigenous people, you know, from their own and own culture, you know, um, it was interesting, uh, you know, in, in Alaska, you know, we're familiar with the Alaska Federation of Natives art market, right? And to participate in that market, you have to be an indigenous person, right? And you have to be an Alaska Native person. Um, well, I guess not just Alaska, you have to be an indigenous person. Uh, and so that's always been kind of like my my sort of like gauge, right? Uh, but when I visited Canada, um, you know, they have art markets and stuff, but uh, they don't require sort of like proof of indigenous sort of ancestry, which is a whole nother discussion on like the assimilative practices of like sort of CIBs and BIA and such. Um, but I remember I was going through there and um, there was a person who was, uh, you know, who was sitting next to a, an indigenous elder and they were making the same things um, but they were making it in a production way that was uh, like they had a they had a um, they had a cusp buck. And then you had um, this indigenous person with two cusp bucks, you know, at their table selling them. And then you had this non-native person with, you know, 50 cusp bucks, you know, that were kind of made in like this assembly sort of way, you know, that this person had learned this design. And, you know, and I asked them and I was just so shocked and surprised to find out that they were not native. And yet they were sort of appropriating this culture right next to, you know, uh, an indigenous person, you know, 
And it just showed me that um, so much of appropriation is about capitalism and it's about kind of making, you know, um, some sort of like capital from it. This person was making, you know, monetary capital, but there's also social capital. There's also sort of opportunity capital. You know, I think that there's um, a lot of like uh, people that I that I've met in the past, you know, have, you know, taken on uh, decolonizing residencies, you know, and they were a non native person, you know, and I think that it's like looking at these kind of things and, um, you know, it's part of all of our responsibility to not accept that, you know, because those are spaces, you know, that inequity are should be made and created for indigenous people. And I think that we have to question those things and we have to be critical of them. Um, and this isn't about like, you know, cutting someone off and like canceling them forever. You know, this is about holding those institutions accountable because we can tell those decolonial stories, we can tell those cultural stories, we can tell all those things without, uh, really without help from anybody, <laughs> you know? And it's, it's like, how do we um, empower people uh, to be able to even own their own sort of uh, experiences in those spaces? I'm sorry, but you can't decolonize without indigenous people. <laughs> Um, I think that that just seems to be kind of the basic requirement, uh, but some people are trying. <laughs> yeah, I kind of I kind of went off on a tangent there. Um, but yeah, is there is there anything else anyone would like to share? I apologize, I had gotten the time wrong, so we have more time, so we can do more discussions on things. Just the question of like, how do you know? It comes down to the same thing as just do the work. Um, I do the work as a native person to make sure because you can't always be just yesterday. I saw a pretty cool, um, which looked like pretty authentic form line um, designs on some clothing and accessories and uh, looking it up and it wasn't obvious that it was an indigenous owned company. So then looking more and they do list the native artists, which is a very good sign. Um, but it was clear to me from reading it that it was a non-indigenous company that paid native artists for the designs they then printed. And that becomes to me a decision, like, like uh, native people are getting paid in this and credited and that's important. Um, is it something I want enough, you know, or is good enough to put? And I, it, right now, I haven't made the purchase. It's sort of something I'm like, oh, I'm going to sit with and see who else knows them or, or what this is about. And just be able to know, like, there isn't a single thing on that website that was important enough to me to get to sort of uh, leave out Native people or, or make it harder for Native people. Like, that's something I want to make sure I do. Um, and I have many times sort of looked things up and that were cool <laughs> or that I wanted or that were cool pieces of art um, that it does get disappointing when you go like, okay, I don't believe they're Native. And it does come down to some research. I've kind of come up with keywords that I'll actually even look for or um, as Peter was said, you know, like listing the specific indigenous group they're from is a better sign. It's not always the sign. And I will say like, as, as someone now who is part of hiring native artists, um, actors, creative workers for my plays and stuff, uh, there's times I've gotten it wrong. Um, and some of the stuff you have to take at face value where people are saying they are native. And then you find out after that they're not and that's crushing um and you you do like some of that's just something that native people have to work with and deal with and figure out how we're dealing with because i don't want to impose sort of um colonized standards at the same time people are lying <laughs> people are literally lying and how do i handle that um i want to be able to trust them so some of it's just do the work and some of it's allowing some grace that you're gonna mess up. <laughs> I've messed up big um, and bad faith people will present it as native that won't. And 
when you realize that, stop, <laughs> you know, like stop promoting or using or, or um, even displaying some of that. Um, but for the most part, there, there are some obvious things that come up when you actually just do the work and it's not that deep in, like you can find out pretty quickly that someone is or isn't representing a real community or is native inspired. Yeah, I think that that's, that's a really great wrap up of that question, you know, that it is, it's about your research and it's about doing the work, um, you know, and kind of looking for those obvious signs, you know, um, sometimes it's a little bit more nuanced, you know, it's a non-native person, you know, learning how to do a specific, um, you know, technique in processing a material you know, and, and wanting to utilize that in the fashion industry, you know, and, you know, really kind of push that forward. Um, there's a certain level of uh, hierarchy that comes with that, you know, is that the Native people are, are meant to sort of, uh, you know, teach and share all their knowledge. Um, but if you're taking that knowledge and then put, applying it to kind of like this model that doesn't recognize them, that isn't sort of like, um, that they are not benefiting from, you know, that there's there's a there's another sort of nuance that that's culturally appropriative, even though they learned from an indigenous person how to process that material. You know, if you're if you're just taking that knowledge and then using it, you know, for your own gain, that's another form, you know, of cultural appropriation that's that's pretty damaging, you know, and again, part of that cherry picking of our culture that people want, you know, and um, you know that kind of thing is 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 important and sacred to us, and uh, you know deserve we deserve to be listened to when we when we call it out in those those arenas. You know something I I think that was like a really great uh, uh, a page that Don had created was um, kind of like when you hear sort of like common statements you know from cultural appropriators, and uh, you know even even sometimes confusing experiences for us. And I just want to read some of those. Um, uh, I'd also like to, you know, we have the, you know, the next 15 minutes, if anyone has any burning questions, if you put it in the chat, uh, we'll get it to us. And I'm sure we can get to a couple of them. Um, but I'm just going to read a couple of these statements. And, you know, I'd love all of you to maybe respond to them, you know, so here are some common statements you hear from people. Um, but I'm honoring you. I'm spreading the work, I, but I respect Native rights. I, there's also kind of this impression of, you know, if, if someone's selling it, then it's not, I, then it's not appropriating it if, if you decide to replicate it, because if they're selling it, then it's not that important to culture. So just like with those statements, um, you know, maybe Peter or, or Demi, do you have any sort of initial reactions to, to those things? I know that we talked about it previously. Sure, I, I have a short one that I could give and maybe Demi can maybe have some more specific examples. I think like what I hear is all deflection and defensiveness and um, denial. Like it's, it's that very nice like coded, often like very American way of, um, saying no by saying yes, you know, or, or like this really bizarre, like, I, I don't even know how to contextualize it and verbalize it, but it's this very bizarre kind of like language that I think is language of an oppressor um, of, of, you know, we could call it gaslighting, um, but it's, it's the, the privilege and the oppressor has the ability to just like make up whatever they want to make up and, and say whatever they want to say, and that we have to kind of like listen to it and usually it makes them sound good. So I respect native rights, but um, I'm honoring you um, instead of like listening to us like, hey, no, actually you're not. Um, so I, I guess I would like kind of say that it just seems like it's in a very oppressive kind of like language um, to uphold that position of power and to deny um, really confronting and dealing with the issue at hand, Koyana. Yeah, thank thank you, Peter. Yeah, Demi, do you have any any initial thoughts from from that? Yeah, I I agree. I feel like one way I uh, I perceive that is like a power dynamic, and I feel that um, 
it's not going to be a long time until that that power dynamic doesn't make sense anymore because I feel like the more we move into the future and the more collaboration and authentic representation there is, the the less that those those questions or those excuses will hold any weight. They just won't culturally. And I think that, you know, it's an opportunity and it's a responsibility and a call to, you know, to native artists and non-native artists alike to, you know, really focus on, you know, that authenticity. Because at the end of the day, I mean, you know, I feel like that's, you know, true art is is authenticity when you're true to yourself and you're true to your artistic self and your artistic statement. Um, but yeah, I just, I, I just feel that those are those excuses, you know, that they're the, the more the more that these relationships are forged, and, and the more that, you know, cultural collaboration is, you know, is becoming prevalent that uh, culturally those won't be accepted anymore. Because I can already picture ways that those aren't accepted with with other cultures, and I won't go into detail about it, but I mean, like, you know, there's certain things that, you know, are worn and certain things that are said uh, based around indigenous culture that would not be, you know, accepted, tolerated for other cultures. And um, yeah, I, I think that it's changing. And I think that's, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a good hopeful vibe coming around. Thank you, Demi. Uh, appreciate that. Appreciate both both of your answers in that. You know, I think that, um, you know, that there is kind of like this defensiveness that you hear coming up, you know, and it's it's kind of defending actions. And I think part of that defensiveness comes from a guilt of knowing, you know, that you're kind of taking something that it doesn't belong to you and representing it. Uh, there's a couple questions that I want to address in the uh, in the chat and want to make sure we have time for them because they're really great. So um, the first question here, it says, you know, um, thanking us like for our labor and the clarity and insights. Um, and they have two questions. Uh, what are some self-assurance or even self-care methods you all use with dealing with the negative impacts of cultural appropriation on yourself? And then thank you for talking about elders experiences. I would appreciate any thoughts you have on younger people side of things. I work with Alaska Native youth. What would you tell me? What would you tell them on the topic of cultural appropriation or general creative pursuits? Um, yeah, I'll just I'll just open that up to, to anyone who would like to like to answer. I'd say on the first one of like self-care, self-assurance, just go to Native people. I mean, when that happens, it literally is like, whether it's like, I'm texting you because this is so frustrating. And it literally it's just, especially my my Native uh, women, friends, sisters, um, who have a tendency to be able to be like, I hear you, that's terrible, I'll lift you up. It's just go to them. When it comes to um, thoughts on younger people side of things, it's just going in, with that support system, um, going in with um, knowing who to go to, knowing your own culture's um, idea of what's appropriate or not. I think that's really important. Um, and part of that helps you to gain the support. Um, I, I did have an experience with a very negative thing that was said, you shouldn't be doing that. Um, but I built up that support. I'd, I'd gone to the people and gotten permission and um, done years actually of work on it so that all these people had my back um, and it made it an us kind of tackling the issue versus them. And I can't tell you how important that support system is once you really dive into it. I agree. I agree. I think that that's so important. And um, the support system, that's what that's what I utilize, you know, my aunties are my support system, you know, anytime I'm having having issues. Um, usually once I've confronted someone and had a bad reaction <laughs> and needing support for, uh, you know, just moral support in that. But um, yeah, Peter, did you did you have anything to add? Yeah, I, I think uh, what you both touched on um, is a lot of my initial thoughts, uh, as well as who are you collaborating with? So not only if that occurs, going to your support, but also having your support being your partners um, and being able to also say no to things, being able to recognize what seems like a trap or what seems like unhealthy or toxic and to not do it, which is hard, right? It's, it's very hard because 
that is the dominant space. And so often if we as, as artists want work, you know, and inclusion, we often have to submit ourselves to various forms of settler colonial violence um, mm -hmm. in order to get into those spaces. Um, and so it's hard, right? It's hard because we have bills to pay. We have a passion. Uh, we have a responsibility to uphold these cultural traditions and way of life, to spread them, to share them, to keep them alive, to teach them. Um, so it's hard of like, well, where do, where do we go at times? And so I think it's okay where, you know, you recognize that opportunity and that opportunity doesn't feel right. I think that's important um, to not take that on. And in regards to youth, I think there was also something earlier mentioned in that question about the elders. And I would say, bring the elders in. Um, mm -hmm. and, and, and I think that creating that space, right? Cause it's, it's this interconnectedness, it's this link, it's this cycle um, that I think is very much an indigenous perspective and, and looking at through the, you know, in, through the generations. So if we're talking about youth, we also need to be talking about elders. If we're talking about elders, we also need to be talking about youth. Um, and I guess to like, finally to like the reaching, you know, realizing the support of our ancestors, those that, that aren't here with us in their physical form. Uh, I think the spiritual components of our culture provide us with a lot of strength. And there's a lot of wisdom from our ancestors that, that provide us with so much. Michael Yellowbird um, does work on neurology and trauma. And I had a, <clears throat> the opportunity to hear him speak. And he talked about how all these things that our ancestors did of singing and dancing um, and just like kind of on and on and like from sweat baths to cold plunges and stuff like that all help with overcoming trauma. So to, to embrace your culture and embrace the way of your culture and have that help you. That's wonderful. Um, I want to touch on one more question um, on the last couple minutes, and I think it was a really great one. Uh, you know, um, there's there's so many questions. I think maybe I'll try to copy them and then address, you know, send them out to you. Um, but uh, so this one was like along with along with tribal affiliation. I was I was curious about race affiliation. I've seen some white people creating images that, have, that are created for native people and social causes. It made me feel weird and I wonder why it wasn't stated that they were white in a more blatant way. Because there may be assumptions based on the work that they do for native groups. If native people have come forward with our native identity, shouldn't it be the same for non-native people? The lines between allyship and assimilation. I couldn't agree with this more, not just quite in this situation, but I think that, um, you know, that there's, there's many instances where you kind of see people kind of being able to get away with, you know, sort of this, this affiliation to something, um, you know, as sort of part of already part of kind of like that community. And, you know, I always, I always think, you know, what part of what, what, what people want from me is my identity and for me to be completely transparent in who I am, to give you all this part of my native self, right? But then there's no expectation in the other way to introduce yourself to me, you know? And, and I think that part of what you create, you know, that you should also be, um, that that should be, that that should also be, uh, be, be talked about, particularly if you're working within these sort of realms, um, of activism of 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 social causes that in, that involve indigenous people um if you're if you're a non-indigenous person if the assumption is made that you're indigenous um even if the thought goes crosses your head you know that that is something that you should be really transparent about you know because being transparent about that i think is 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 true allyship you know um we're, we're just about out of time. I wish we would give more time. Apologies for that. But um, is there is there any other any other kind of like final thoughts that we want to end with? Yeah, I just want to kind of like throw it back to our speakers. Um, you know, Teddy Mayak said that uh, a pro cultural appropriation um, is the feeling that my culture is like being stolen you know, that myself, my identity is being stolen. And he wrote this really beautiful paper that you can find, you know, all over the internet, what it feels like to have your culture stolen is what it's titled. And um, yeah, 
I, w I would just like to, you know, kind of give it back to the group, uh, you know, on, on, on their feelings of cultural appropriation and, you know, what's a, what's a path forward? I know it always comes down to like earrings for a native woman, but it does. <laughs> it's, to me, it's, it's so wrapped up in like, um, I get the question a lot. Like I have, I seen these earrings or is given these bracelets or whatever, is it okay? I love that they ask that because they're thinking about it. Um, but it's always, yes. <laughs> you know, like, and there are some caveats, like make sure you're doing it respectfully. Try and understand and know who the artist is if you can. I don't know the artists of all the things I was given, but I try and know as many of them as I can. Um, we love to see authentic native art. What I really hope you take from this is not, don't do it. Don't get into native art. Don't um, create things with native people. I hope you can be encouraged and see how powerful the authentic art can really be. So if anything, I'm, I'm just hoping people feel encouraged to actually engage more, not less with native people on this. Yes, because it because it totally can be done in a responsible way. A cultural appreciation is about appropriate collaboration and responsible sort of like acknowledgement. You know, if you're going to wear a, a, a Yupik Kusbuk, if you're going to wear some Dene earrings, you should know who made them. And so when somebody compliments you and somebody represents that, you're able to kind of give power back to people in what they do. Um, yeah, P Peter, Demi, are, are there any final you know, thoughts you'd like to share? Demi, if you have one, go ahead. Um, I, I don't know, maybe just final thoughts. I really wanted to just touch upon the, the kids, you know, and that these cultures are still alive. And I think uh, one of the powerful things that I've experienced before my mom passed away about five years ago, she would take the illustrations of the storybooks, the Yanni Da storybook, little comic books that I made in, in slideshow format, go around to elementary schools and tell the stories, but with that visual, you know, comic book projected on the screen. And she got such a huge, you know, uh, you know, impact. She had such an impact on, on so many kids. And she's, you know, when she passed away, she had stacks of letters from kids that, you know, we're writing her, you know, telling her how much they appreciated sharing the stories. Cause I think for a lot of them, they don't realize that it's right there, that they're living in a living culture and that it surrounds them at all time. Um, and of course that just connects back with the elders. And I, I just think that that's where the, you know, that's where it lies is, you know, you know, teaching the kids and then learning from the elders. So mm -hmm. thank you for letting me be a part of this. Thank very, you. Very honored. Yeah, well, that's just a beautiful example of what your mom did, right? This is, we can represent ourselves, you know, in our current artwork and the things that we do, you know, and, and that's, that's truly, you know, why cultural appropriation is inappropriate, you know, because we, <laughs> because, because we have the ability to represent ourselves in the best way, and just work with us, because everything you do will be better <laughs> in that, but, um, yeah, Peter, I think you started us off in such a good way, kind of like, um, you know, going back to the cultural appropriation is really um, a trickle down of the systemic racism that we see within our institutions and, and our, our current society. Um, yeah, I really appreciate you starting us off kind of like by hitting it, hitting it like that, because it is. And uh, yeah, is there, is there anything else you'd like to, you'd like to share? Koyana, um, I think maybe I won't because I think it'll be repetitive. Like what you all have just said is so beautiful. And then also I think what, you know, what you're saying as well is, is how we opened it, right? It's about recognize not only that we're fully human, but we also have agency, you know, of our own lives, of, of our own culture. And that it's important for our voices to speak. And we want you to participate. We want you to appreciate it. We want you to respect it. We want you to interact with us. Um, it also includes that, you know, recognizing that we have agency to do this and recognizing that's important for us to speak for ourselves. And I think like what Vera is saying too, like there, you know, there's can be that fear, 
you know, I think around it, I, th I think there's a lot of delicacy, right? A lot of fragility. And apparently I had more to say than I thought I would. <laughs> but in closing, but I, I think that there, I think maybe some of that defensiveness is also with some of that hesitation of like afraid to get it wrong, which I think, you know, involves work. It involves the work um, of, if you want to appreciate it, involves the work of researching and understanding. Um, and it involves you being vulnerable and it involves you being open to learning from us and hearing from us. And, and within that mutual respect, there's, there's, you know, we will, we will welcome you, you know, we, we, we welcome you. Um, and, and Goyana, Goyana for listening. Yeah, Chanan, I think that that's, that's a really beautiful way to end this. So, um, yeah, thank you so much. Apologies for going over. <laughs> I'd like to thank you, the speakers, for sharing your thoughts and insights with us. And I'd like to thank you, the audience, for joining us. We had some really lovely comments of appreciation in the chat box. Thank you very much. And everyone, take care. Janan.